Phil is a lifelong beekeeper who first learned from his grandmother the thrill of understanding a hive filled with buzzing bees. And since then, Phil has worked hard to understand both big and small questions in beekeeping and in life. Phil has about 1,200 hives, producing about 250 barrels of honey annually. And his hives are scattered in the country centered around Starbuck, Manitoba. And beekeeping tends to be a solitary and contemplative business, so Phil has lots of time to think when working with his bees. And as a result, Phil leads a double life. In one, he is a beekeeper, and in the other, he is an armchair philosopher and educator. Phil has a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Manitoba and has been teaching various basic courses in philosophy since 1993 and a farm advisor in the Faculty of Agriculture since 2014. And Phil and his wife, Fona, have two children, Timmy and Jaina. So thanks so much for being, and Phil is also um, the president here with Direct Farm Manitoba. So you'll see him throughout the week. So thanks very much, Phil. Thank you, Christy. Just give me a moment to share my slides and perhaps push the cat out of the way here. Um, So I hope that you can see uh, my slides uh, and looking at a photo of my grandmother and grandfather and their hives, uh, which uh, that photo is from, we think, the 1930s. Uh, and certainly on their farm, the bees were a sideline that contributed mightily to the overall success of the family farm. Sorry, I just, how do I advance here? There we go, okay. So before we get into the bees, uh, I'd like to just uh, think about what makes a really good uh, enterprise for a direct marketing farm. Uh, many of us are, are in this uh, line of work by having a passion and then trying to figure out how to make it work. But if you were to do it the in reverse, if you're trying to re, you know, re-engineer your business, you'd want to start with, well, what product do I want to work with? Um, and so think of the list of things that you would want in that product. You'd want your customers to have an understanding of what the product is and, and, and have some confidence in it. You'd want your processing or your input costs to be as low as, as reasonable. You'd like the, the value of that final product to be reasonably well, uh, reasonably strong. You'd want that product to have, you know, stable shelf life or a durable value. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of us have had the, uh, have watched product wither on the vine, so to speak, unsold, and wouldn't it be nice if that would last a little longer? You'd like the regulatory burden on your product to be low, the less inspection and paperwork involved, the better. And you'd like that product to uh, have strong synergy with what else is going on on the farm. You'd like everything to mesh well together. So that, if you're thinking about direct marketing, that's kind of the dream list, right? That's So then uh, I'm gonna argue that uh, in, including bees on the farm can maybe give you uh, a decent number of those lists. And um, so that's, that's, this is kind of the focus of the presentation is which of these um, targets can we hit? So when I go through the bees, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to speak to the productivity, the marketability, uh, the messaging that would surround having bees on the farm. And just in case it all sounds too good, I'm going to talk about some challenges and complexities. And if time allows, just a little taste of some how-to. But this isn't uh, primarily um, a how to beekeep um, uh, presentation. Um, this is sort of a motivational, like maybe why you would want to, and then uh, we can follow up uh, if you decide to go ahead. But I'm going to give you some options on bees as we go. So first of all, productivity. Uh, bees don't require additional land. Once you have, you need as much ground as the hives sit on 
you don't need more more acres for land. So uh, they'll forage on whatever's available in the area. Uh, they don't, they'll fly over the fence. Um, so for many farms where uh, productivity is limited by the land base of the farm, bees are an interesting venture because that isn't a restriction for, for, for honeybee hives. Many beekeepers, including myself, have relatively little land uh, and that we put our bees on the land of others by their permission. And so in my own case, I have about 40 different sites that uh, I have permission to put bees on. There's a strong synergy between having bees and horticulture enterprises. Uh, I think it's well known that pollination increases the productivity of, well, sorry, the cat forwarded us too early here. Um, that, uh, darn it, I, okay, so say hello to everyone, and then away you go. Sorry, uh, she really skipped me away here. So it's well known that um, that most fruit-bearing crops, and that includes both, uh, you know, the strawberries and apple trees and so on, that people often think about being attractive to bees, but also, uh, you know, melons, pumpkins, peppers, tomatoes uh, are also increased by adequate pollination. This is uh, the photo is of a bee pollinating a pumpkin flower. So I, I suggest that we can achieve some synergy between enterprises by one enterprise increasing the productivity of another. A little bit more, uh, less direct, I guess say, is the marketability of, of the bee and the bee products. Honey has high consumer acceptance. People know what it is. They generally think of it as being a healthy product. Uh, the photo there uh, from, and I just sort of grabbed it off the internet as a typical example of how people think about honey as being this sort of uh, nearly miraculous food product that can help you in all sorts of ways. Um, as a honey producer, I don't really uh, like to get trapped into defending the latest uh, urban myth about uh, honey, but I certainly of that list, I think the, the 21st is probably the most, uh, the one that I can, I can speak to, uh, you know, being true, uh, you know, number 19, the anti-aging, um, uh, you know, i I get older every year. So, so far that's not working out. Uh, but I think that the fact that uh, there are items on that list that most of us think are are plausible. Tells you a little bit about how consumers generally understand honey. Uh, so you, you're not going to have to do a lot of explaining about your product. And that, I think, for, for many of us that are growing more obscure or producing things in unusual ways, would be a bit of a relief. The regulatory burden for honey is quite low. Uh, you can uh, take produce honey on your farm, bottle it, and sell it just about anywhere, except there's maybe some restrictions on larger retail settings, but you can sell it on your farm, you can sell it at a farmer's market, you can sell it uh, door to door. There's with very little regulation. You have to be registered as a beekeeper. That's about it. Uh, honey has a, a very stable character it's uh, very unusual for it to spoil, very unusual for it to be uh, dangerous to human health. And so the, the food regulators have, have largely uh, walked away from it. And, uh, and, and hand in hand with that is the, very, the, the stability of honey. Every pound of honey that I haul to the farmer's market and don't sell, I can haul home and sell again the next week and more maybe the next week or maybe the next week after that. Um, so my, my spoilage, my, my loss of product due to being unable to sell it is extremely minimal. 
And so uh, that, I think, is something that's uh, underappreciated uh, when you think about direct marketing, that the product will wait until a buyer comes along. Hand in hand with that markability is the messaging that uh, a farm that has bees should, it, should or maybe can engage in. Uh, when we're talking about direct marketing farms, we're talking about farms that are engaging with consumers that also want high engagement. Uh, there's language within our community talking to those folks not as consumers, but rather as partners or eaters or other kinds of more uh, egalitarian relationships. Um, we like and we seek out those consumers that, that want to think deeply about where and how they get their food. Those folks care deeply about the farms they're supporting, the farm practices that their dollars are, are supporting, the impression on the environment that that farm is leading. Um, and whether that's positive or negative. And having bees in your farm story will tend to increase those metrics for you. Um, and I'm not uh, taking the position that that's necessarily uh, right or true. Uh, I want to be sort of neutral on the politics here. But when you talk about bees, you will have people's attention about um, issues relating to uh, health and environment and whether that's fair or right i think is a is a question for another day i think in terms of just in terms of messaging uh you, you will hear people's attention come into focus when bees are in the discussion is that because bees have um been uh on the radar for uh, environmental issues over the last uh, probably generation, maybe, or as we talked a lot about bees over the last 10 or 15 years, because people pay attention to it, uh, I probably a bit of both. Uh, I don't want to get into the psychology of it here, um, but I think that you'll have you'll have folks' attention if you include bees in your farm's messaging. So if you want to. If, if your direct marketing uh, strategy in engaging with consumers is to do some messaging about how your farm is a well-run, responsible uh, farm, a good steward of, of, of the earth, having bees as part of that story uh, is, is a strong uh, position to take. And I would encourage you to think deeply and honestly about, about that. On the regulatory side, uh, the burden, uh, the cost of, of compliance with regulation is extremely low. Um, so you can sell honey from the farm gate pretty much as is. Uh, it's classified in Manitoba as a low risk food product. You uh, are not subject to inspection unless you wanted to sell your honey uh, either across a provincial boundary or an international boundary, and then it becomes a federal jurisdiction issue. Uh, there are some recommended standards, right? Your honey should be not contaminated, uh, be of good quality, um, and those are not hard standards to hit. Um, and there is some language about direct marketing honey in the direct marketing your food product um, guidance from Manitoba Agriculture. And that does mention that you, as if you're the beekeeper, you should be uh, registered. That is more, the regulation actually in Manitoba is more focused on the health of the hives than it is the honey uh, product itself. And so actually being registered as a beekeeper has some advantages in, in making uh, the services of the Department of Agriculture's bee inspectors available for uh, checking that your hives are healthy and, and free of disease and so on. So I recommend you do that. Um, when you're when you have the honey, it you know you bottle it pretty much straight from the harvesting process. Uh, a little bit of straining or settling. Uh, most of the impurities uh, in honey will honey is a very heavy liquid, 
and uh, nearly all impurities will float and then you, they can be removed manually by skimming. Uh, the odd, uh, you know, if you happen to have a nut or a bolt or a, a, a metal uh, filing in the, in, the, in the honey through, uh, you know, uh, some, some, <laughs> some disaster in the processing, that will tend to sink to the bottom. And so if you put the honey in the tank and wait a day or two, you actually pretty much automatically get a very, uh, very fine, very clear product. And so um, that's really all that's required to have very high quality honey. So, uh, and then the packaging is readily available. Um, so, so I encourage that. Um, so is honey a dream product? Well, we have the customer understanding. We have, I think, relatively high value in terms of like on a strictly uh, sort of, you know, dollars per pound basis. It's not bad compared to veggies or, or other things. Uh, the, it's durable, right? It doesn't spoil very easily. In fact, that's probably part of the reason it's perceived as being a healthy product. Uh, regulatory burdens low. Good. Oh, the darn cat's back. Sorry, folks. There we are. Uh, I guess she thinks I should move it along. I, this is a lot of talking, so uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to pick up the pace here. Um, law strong synergy with the early farm enterprises, and uh, now input processing costs. The processing, you know, quite low. The input costs, that's where probably over the last uh, generation of beekeepers, things have changed. Traditionally, if you get older sort of resources on bees, a book out of the library, or, you know, advice from uh, a, an elderly beekeeper, they talk like, you know, you just let the bees do their thing and away you go. There have been some disease pressures that have uh, introduced pests uh, that have made uh, it more difficult and more expensive to keep the bees. And so I'm putting sort of a 50% uh, on that one. So we have like, you know, five and a half out of six. Mm, you know, not bad. But there are challenges. And the first and the most obvious is the bee sting, and it hurts, and not everyone's into that. And uh, so, you know, I could say, oh, this is the greatest product ever, you, you know, um, and at the end of the day, if you don't want to get stung, then I would I, I'd encourage you not to get too deep into a beehive. Uh, and it's also super hard work. Uh, you know, the, the photo there, the, the person wearing... Uh, what looks like rubber gloves that probably don't breathe worth a hoot and overalls and a hat and you can't wipe the uh, moisture off your face uh, and quite honestly the best time to look after bees is when it's really really hot and so if you're gonna if you think you know you're gonna get out there um, on a nice cool day and sit in the shade and look after your bees uh, that's not really how it works. You want to, um, you know, you want to get into those hives when when the sun is shining and the air is still, and uh, everyone with any sense is um, in the shade. So, um, so that's the reality about beekeeping. And before you get into the how to, it's do you want it? And um, I, and this is not cut out for everybody. And when we're looking at challenges, we also have to face the reality that uh, bees can get viruses. Uh, and a lot of the discussion about bee health over the last 20 years has been uh, highly related to the spread of a number of viruses. The, the, you know, these are pandemics of bees, essentially, has been what's happening. Uh, the well, most well known is the deformed wing virus. In the top photo, you can see uh, the golden bees uh, have normal wings, and the bee that's a slightly darker in her abdomen, ha her wings you can see are not formed. 
uh, and so she'd be unable to fly. And if, if a hive gets that virus and, you know, 15, 20% of the, the bees in the colony uh, start to exhibit those symptoms, that hive is gonna start to fall apart very quickly. And those viruses uh, we think are spread from hive to hive relatively rapidly by the, uh, the pest, the varroa mite. And that's that little brown dot on the thorax of the bee in the lower picture. Um, and you do not need uh, very high levels of mites in your hives to start to have serious concerns for whether the hive is going to survive, especially in our severe climate. Uh, that hive has to be absolutely A1 condition on October 1st, or it's never going to make it to March 1st. So, uh, you know, you know having, having this disease uh, concerns well in hand in our uh, very limited uh, summer season is, is, is absolutely critical to successful beekeeping. Now, complexities, because I think there's good news here. We do not need to stick our hands in hives if we want bees on our farm. There's many species of bee. There are less intensive forms of beekeeping than being, uh, you know, guy with veil lifting heavy things uh, kind of beekeeping. There are much more, there are uh, natural forms of beekeeping. And the pollination, some of the synergy stuff is available basically for free. So when we talk about bees, it's really easy to think about honeybees. And I, I want to expand this talk, and maybe this is a bit of a bait and switch. Maybe you're here for honeybees, and I'm giving you uh, uh, choices here, and I apologize for that. But the, the Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, is one species. There's at least five other species of honeybee around the world. And there's about just under, we think, 20,000 known species of bee around the world. Those are sort of non-honeybee species. And we think, and, and you know, this is one of those you don't know what you don't know situations, but they, it's estimates of maybe as many as 10,000 other species of bee out there. Uh, and so, Lots of these bees are very good pollinators, sometimes a very specific, sometimes only a single species of plant with which it has a, a reciprocal relationship with. The bee in the, in the photo, I think pollinating uh, trefoil, that looks like bird's foot trefoil to me, as a bumblebee, a very effective pollinator of, of many uh, crops in Manitoba. And the bumblebee, uh, is, is, you know, is a wild bee. It doesn't need a whole lot of looking after. What it needs is for us to get out of its way. When we think about bees, um, bees are organized uh, in a, a couple different ways by the scientists, but I think the most interesting is their social organization. Uh, so we think of, uh, often think of the honeybee as being the typical bee but actually it's somewhat unusual in that it has this uh, very complex social organization with uh, m you know, many thousands of bees cooperating together. And we, those are the social bees. We also have what are called gregarious bees and there's many species of these. The leafcutter bee is the most well known of those where they don't cooperate, but they like to hang out. So you'll often find large numbers of them together, even though there's no shared work. Uh, lots of these are ground dwelling uh, or forest cavity type bees. And um, so the idea that, you know, there's a bunch of bees that are gregarious, that really enjoy each other's company, uh, do better when they're gathered in groups, but actually uh, are kind of each doing their own thing. I think that's kind of cool. And then there's a bunch of solitary bees. Uh, the bumblebee is a typical example of that. 
This is about 95% of all bee species, that 20,000 uh, number I mentioned a moment ago, 95% of those are uh, individual bees. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what your options are, uh, there's those. You could also think about bees being either specialists or generalists. Some bees pollinate either a single or a relatively small number of plants. Uh, often this is a highly uh, co-evolution situation where uh, the bee and the plant have, have a synergistic relationship of their own. Uh, and often that's kind of uh, timing that the, especially the bees that dwell in the ground uh, will incubate and emerge at certain soil temperatures, which turn out to be pretty much the right conditions for their target pollinator plant to have come into bloom. So, um, you know, one reason why the bee might only pollinate one plant is because in their habitat, at their time of emergence, that's the flower that is available. And those specialized pollinators are very effective pollinators for those species because they'll seek them out. Uh, a honeybee, as a generalist, will on a single foraging trip visit a apple tree, your carragana, a dandelion, get enough nectar and go back home. Well, on that trip, she pollinated no flowers because the pollens from the different flowers didn't match each other. Whereas if you have a bee that's going to go find a crocus and then all it wants is another crocus and it will fly over the dandelion to get to the crocus, you'll have that crocus pollinated uh, because it's a specialist. So you'll have lots of uh, chances to uh, have bees that might be focused on just a single crop. When you want to talk about protecting plants, you have to understand that some of part of that might be needing the right bees to pollinate them. Not all bees pollinate all flowers. Some bees are too large to get into the flowers. Sometimes a very tiny bee can't pollinate a large flower. The timing of these flowers uh, has to match the timing of the bees and there's a ton of concern these days that with climate change that will no longer always work out. And Hello. so we have challenges Hi. that apologize for the background noise. Uh, no, and then oh, bees I... tend to forage relatively close to their nest. Uh, and so there's challenges with making sure bees are where the flowers are. Good news is the pollination is available uh, sometimes for free. And uh, you can um, get the, uh, a beekeeper, someone like myself, to put bees on or near your property by, by inviting them. And we'll share some honey with you in return. So uh, those are my hives on, my, on uh, I think that photo is from up near the Lake Manitoba. Sorry, I'm being distracted here uh, at about 1030. Um, and so we'll, um, you know, you, you, you can get the pollination without the work if you're willing to share some of your space. You can also get that pollination from wild bees. This is going to take a little bit more work from you. Um, you're going to need to provide the right conditions for those bees to thrive on your farm. And in return, they'll pollinate your crops for free. And uh, there's lots of evidence. I, I've got one quote here, but um, there's all sorts of evidence that wild bees are very excellent pollinators of, of cultivated crops if they're given a chance. The reality is that on, on much of agriculture, uh, the bees aren't uh, given full opportunity to uh, participate in agriculture. 
the field sizes are too large, uh, the uh, pesticide use is too, uh, too widespread, uh, not enough habit uh, nesting habitat. Um, so, you know, on a, on a typical, say, section of land in Manitoba, the wild bees will very effectively pollinate the first 15 or 20 feet of the field and the middle part is, is largely ignored because they don't, they don't need that much space. In Canada, we think we have about 850 or so wild species. Uh, we think most of those species are in danger, but actually no one's, the, the scientific work to even know if these species are endangered is not, not really there. And uh, the, the threats to these bees are mainly loss of habitat, the, uh, the loss of foraging territory, and also intermingled with that appropriate nesting uh, uh, conditions. So what can you do? Well, you can provide uh, both through your farm practices, the, the appropriate foraging habitat, and also possibly a nesting habitat. So here we have the photo is someone who's got a, a bunch of uh, tubes, um, which are basically just uh, stalks uh, and uh, hung up on a post so that there'll be lots of wild bees uh, that if, if there are wild bees, they will seek out the, the, the tube that suits them best and, and put a nest in there. And you could have hundreds of, of bees nesting in that thing. And look at the, the foraging behind means that those bees will have abundant uh, sources of food close to their home. Protecting... Um, and have the bees means having the habitat. And that means having available forage, not just a narrow window when one specific crop blooms, but throughout the growing season. So, uh, you know, uh, and the, the photo of the sunflowers there, I get calls every year, you know, my crop is in bloom, but there's no bees around. And you go out to visit the site and there's, there isn't a tree or a, uh, piece of uncultivated land for miles and you know why would I put bees there for one week they'll have much more food than they ever need the rest of the years are right off if you want to attract bees whether they be honeybees or wild bees uh, you got to have some sort of staggered food availability uh, most people underappreciate how important trees are to bees uh, poplar and willows often yielding nectar and pollen within a week of the uh, major melt off of snow in the spring without if uh, without uh, bush you know usually the scragglier the bush the better for for early spring um, you know my be my beekeeping would be impossible dandelions thank you dandelions uh, fantastic early food source um, so, you know, thinking about what you do on your farm, if you've got your weeds out of control, congratulations, you're awesome. And because uh, all of those things will be feeding bees earlier and better than your actual crops uh, will be so that when you're, by the time your crops are ready to be pollinated, uh, the bees will have built up, there'll be more of them, they'll have been attracted to your location. Uh, you also, it would be real nice to have some fresh, clean water. That can sometimes mean uh, a stream or a pond on your property. Sometimes it can mean having a barrel under a downspout. And if you do that, have a board or, or something floating on the top of the barrel so that the bees uh, can land on something and then sip the water. They can't swim. So if you have just a, a, a water trough with nothing in it, um, that's very hard for them to access and they'll often drown. Uh, whereas if you have um, a floaty, just like, just like kids, they love to splash around on the floaty. So have something that they can, a sponge, a board, um, something that they can land on to, to drink from. And so encourage biodiversity on your farm. All of those trees are feeding bees. Uh, every deciduous tree is a flowering plant. Maples, uh, poplars, 
uh, oaks and elms are all fantastic sources of pollen for bees. You can provide nesting habitats artificially. Uh, one of my neighbors at the farmer's market in St. Norbert makes these beautiful uh, bee nests. Uh, the one on the left has holes poked in clay for those uh, bees that like to be ground uh, or earth-based and then the wooden tubes of uh, various sizes and every bee kind of likes its own size tube that matches its body perfectly. So if you're not sure what species of bee you have on your in your area, uh, the nest with a whole random bunch of different size tubes is perfect, right? And then you could actually, at the end of the year, look at which tubes are occupied and with a set of calipers, make some pretty educated guesses about uh, what species of bee you have. Most, but all those habitats uh, are for the, the, the tree dwelling bees. The vast majority of wild bees are ground dwelling. Uh, we've got sweat bees, mining bees, plaster bees. Uh, often prefer well-drained, uh, sandy or loamy soils, which is exactly what gardeners also like. Uh, they, they love to be in natural locations in your fields, uh, but as soon as you till or destroy that soil, you, the nest can be destroyed. So it's important to be willing to set aside even small portions of land along fence lines or, or hedges that the bees can, can can use as part of their process. Uh, Manitoba Agriculture has a great little handout on protecting and supporting pollinators and they mention uh, you know these non-cropped areas can be uh, a, a, a way to support bees and also to support the farm by encouraging uh, natural pollination. So that, that handout is called protecting and supporting pollinators and I'll I'll leave that to you to, to look at. It's, uh, I think it's a very well put together uh, recommendation, set of recommendations. So the wild bees, they work for free, but you just gotta give them a home and some food and some water. And I would suggest that if you take some steps to enhance a wild bee activity on your farm, that you brag about that to your, your direct market customers. Um, Put up signs on your farm, include uh, your efforts and describe your efforts in your newsletters to your customers. Your customers will love it. And um, typically wild bees, very low, um, this, the more, the less gregarious uh, the bee is, the less defensive it is. As you know, honeybees, um, when they sting, that particular bee will die. And that's true for many species of bee. Uh, so the stinging is a kind of a last ditch effort. And if you're, if you're a bee that is on its own, you're not cooperating with other bees, uh, you're pretty reluctant to throw your life down. And so those wild bees tend to be, you know, lower in density in areas and typically not very defensive. Often you have, well, let's face it, you have wild bees on your farm. You just don't know it if you, if you haven't been looking. And that one reason you don't know is because they haven't stung you. And uh, let's keep it that way, but you could have many more bees without that, that difficulty. So just to sum up where we're at so far, honeybees, great pollinators. They a uh, very generous pollinator, they'll visit almost any flower. And, uh, but they require substantial effort on your part. Uh, so, uh, the initial investment can be quite high. Acquiring a beehive and the necessary equipment to operate it can be as much as $1,000. And you're probably gonna recoup on an annual basis you know, probably more than 200, but probably not more than 350 or so per hive. So, you know, this is gonna be a multi-year uh, uh, situation to, to recoup that initial investment. The products you're gonna market, the honey uh, is, is, you know, has a lot of the virtues of a good product to be marketing directly to consumers. Wild bees don't make you anything, but they pollinate your crops really well. Uh, 
uh, you have nothing to sell, but you've spent nothing. So, you know, that's fair, I guess. And I, and I suggest to you that wild bees will be a very important part of your farm's uh, messaging, the story you tell about your farm and how you're working to protect bees that are so, um, I mean, if, if your farm had a chance to save polar bears, would you include that in your message to your consumers? Darn right you would. Uh, the bees uh, need you just as much as the polar bears do. Um, I, would, I would suggest you would tell your customers about that. So should you add bees to your direct market farm? I hope I've convinced you yes, but I hope I've also encouraged you to think about you know, how and why. Which bees are we going to include in our farm? Doesn't have to be honeybees. You don't have to sell honey to have bees on your farm. You can pollinate your crops. You can uh, promote your local biodiversity. You can reinforce your farm's message as a responsible land user. Uh, all with the wild bees. If you want to go the extra step and sell honey, and if you want to get into the candle making and bees, well, then you need honeybees. But you can get three of those five advantages of bees with the bees that are already on your farm if you help them out a little bit. So here's some easy steps. You can contact a local beekeeper about having bees on or near your farm. You can uh, plant or protect, perhaps enhance or, or protect deciduous trees and shrubs on your farm. Uh, wind breaks and shelter breaks are, uh, shelter belts are important sources of food for bees. Uh, you can consider leaving some areas of your farm unmanaged so that the bees have access to those. It will help if, if you have um, the unmanaged areas of your, of your land closely adjoining the parts of your farm where you want uh, flowering uh, economic crops to grow to be growing. Um, so don't, you know, say, yeah, yeah, my farm's good. I have the old back 40 uh, up the creek there. There's lots of bees there. You know, bring that habitat closer to your farm uh, to get more pollination. And don't get too crazy with the weeds. Uh, it's okay, and, you know, I, on our farm, I love those yellow dandelions. As soon as they start to mature, well, then we mow them. Uh, you know, try to catch them while there's, you know, that, that time between when they're pollinated and when they're, when they have seeds. Um, do I get it perfectly every year? No, I spread my share of dandelion seed around. Do you know what? Dandelion seed will spread by wind for a thousand miles. You getting rid of all your dandelions isn't going to make a whit of difference. So, um, cut the bees some slack, let them have some dandelions. And all those other flowering weeds on your farm, you know, I know that uh, there's part of uh, it is to be human to, to love those perfect straight rows and all that black dirt. Um, I'm not sure that's a lot of work uh, many of us are doing that's really not helping things all that much. Some steps that are a little bit more involved if you want to get into the honeybees. There's a very excellent course that's been uh, running for nearly a century, uh, Beekeeping for the Hobbyist or Hobby Beekeeping at the University of Manitoba. It's taught by uh, the entomologist, the provincial apiarist, and a number of other people at the University of Manitoba who have an, a keen interest in bees. Uh, it's very focused on practical first steps in beekeeping. Uh, those of us that are, you know, really into bees, we can get into the weeds <laughs> metaphorically really quick on, you know, which esoteric method of doing one specific job in a certain way is exactly the right way. But I think uh, if, you're, if you're looking for first steps, take that course, if possible, um, get some practical experience with some beehives. If you have a neighbor or a friend that has a few hives, Invite yourself over sometime when it looks like there's some beekeeping going on and get a feel for those hives before you get your own. Uh, and then when you feel you're ready, 
get a, a small number of hives to start. Do not uh, jump in too deep too quick. Um, beekeeping is, is a challenging way to start. Um, you know, I, I recommend not just one hive because one hive is hard because you're not knowing what's normal. You get a two or three and then one has some difficulty. You notice how it's different than the others. So I recommend two or three hives is a good place to start. But that's already, you're talking, you know, several thousand dollars of investment. I encourage you to, to do some homework on, on learning before you do that. Recommend a couple books. Uh, first of all, for the, uh, the, the diversity of the bee world, two very great books are uh, Keeping the Bees by Larry Packer, um, who, who's gone all over the world and, and discovered a large number of bee species himself. He's based out of Toronto. Uh, he was the one to find out that there's actually about 50 species of undiscovered bee that he could find on the University of Toronto campus. Um, they're, they're out there. Uh, we, the fact that we, when we see the buzzing, we think it's a honeybee. Uh, don't be fooled by that. Uh, bees in your backyard um, are, is also, if you want to sort of do uh, identification of what bees you have, that's great. Uh, Victory Gardens for Bees, you know, how to grow uh, a, a garden that's going to have bees. And actually, uh, a garden, like if you have a, a floral garden that you want for your own visual pleasure, that's exactly what bees want. You want something in bloom all the time. That's exactly what the bees want. On any given day, is there something in bloom that would feed the bee if it was looking for a meal that day? There's a tremendous romance about beekeeping. There I am, uh, my nose in a hive on a beautiful sunny day. And uh, it's typically, you know, those spring days, those days in May when the sun is shining and the bees are, are, are really starting to get excited. Um, man, that's pleasurable. Uh, and the fact that most people are scared of bees and they don't bother you too much while you're doing it, that's a plus. Uh, and so there's just tremendous romance. The keeping of bees is like the direction of sunbeams is a famous quote from Thoreau. But there's a reality too, that uh, beekeeping is complex, difficult business. Uh, Sue Hubble says, the only time I ever believed that I knew all there was to know about beekeeping was the very first year I was keeping them. Every year since I've known less and less and I've accepted the humbling truth that bees know more about making honey than I do. I've been beekeeping all my life and I can assure you she's got that pretty much exactly right. And so there's a cute picture. And with that, I'll bring my comments to a close and I'll see if there are questions. I think there are. Uh, let me see, I will stop sharing. Bill, would you like me to ask the questions out loud or would you like to read them out loud before you answer them? We'd just like uh, to catch them on the recording. I think I can probably read them. Great. Let's see here. Uh, could you have access to the slide presentation? Um, yeah, I can make steps to make sure that we do that. Um, Travis from Ground to Gut Gardens, what a great name. Uh, wintering indoors, uh, great question. Um, so uh, let me, so yes, I winter my bees indoors. My family has been doing that for 50, 60, 70, I don't know how many years. Uh, my mom, who's uh, oh, must be must be about eighty years, uh, she remembers as a child being told because they kept the bees in the root cellar under the house, uh, about twenty or thirty hives, and they were told all winter that the children needed to be quiet to keep the bees alive, 
Now, how much of that was true and how much of that was that my grandmother uh, needing some peace and quiet in a room, in a two room house with uh, eight daughters? Um, probably a bit of both. Uh, wintering bees, uh, it, this is not, the, a honeybee's natural environment is the Mediterranean where it's warm all the time. The fact that they can adapt to, to sometimes successfully wintering in a Manitoba winter is amazing. Uh, being able to help them in that um, is great. The challenge with indoor wintering is most of the designs for good indoor wintering are based on guys like me who have thousands of hives and uh, use the accumulated heat from all the hives as the heat source. And so if you have only a few hives, uh, that's a real challenge to try to figure out how to winter uh, effectively. Uh, there are some alternatives like a bit of a, a, a there was a beekeeper in Manitoba a few years ago who's using no freeze heat tape, the kind of thing you'd wrap a pipe around in kind of a, a loop under uh, his hives to provide just a little extra warmth. Um, and he had good success with that. Um, a lot of winter kill, unfortunately, is um, is not necessarily the temperature, but either lack of food or um, a disease pressure from mites. And so, uh, you know, aggressive feeding in the fall and really being on top of uh, your mite uh, situation. The hard thing for mites is that, uh, like the economic threshold for whether your hives will survive, uh, like one or 2%, like if, if one out of every 100 bees has a mite on September 15, your hive has like a 50-50 chance of making it to spring. Most testing methodologies that you would use to measure your mite load have an error rate of three or four percent. So like by the time you have, you know you have a mite problem, it's usually too late. Um, so uh, that's my wisdom on that. Uh, I'd be happy to touch base with you uh, individually, we can follow up on on, on your own bees. Uh, lots of small bee houses on the market. Are these helpful to attract bees to your garden? Yeah, um, so if you have, if your area does have native bees that are uh, cavity dwelling, so the ones that like to be up in, you know, in a woodpecker hole, but there's no trees left, so there's no hole to be in. Um, then those houses are are good for that. Uh, most of them are, you know, fancy and beautiful and, uh, and an ornament as much as they are a uh, a house for bees. But um, you can, both is good, I think. Um, I would encourage you to get ones that have lots of different, uh, we love uniformity in, in visual attractions. So you don't want them all to have the same holes. You don't want them all to be out of the same material. And quite frankly, you could get pretty much, like if you, if you bought a bunch of two by fours and went to Canadian Tire and bought a cheap set of drill bits that had a bunch of different sizes and just bored a bunch of holes in the wood and hung it up in the trees, uh, you'd get, Pretty much the same benefit. Uh, a friend offered a top bar hive for my farm. Not having experienced any hives, what are your thoughts on top bar versus traditional hives? Hmm. So I'll I'll uh, probably need to provide some context for folks who aren't aware. Uh, so there's uh, for at least a thousand years, if not longer, beekeepers have been arguing about the right hive for farms, the right, the right hives for the bees. And, you know, the pictures I've showed you, I have what is the North American standard for uh, bees, which is developed by a, a guy named Langstroth 150 years ago. Uh, that's not the only design out there. And... Um, there's 
some designs more naturally mimic uh, what bees would do in a in a cavity in a tree. Um, other designs are, you know, focused on what's more convenient for the humans. Bees aren't that picky. Like that, we're talking honeybees here. They're not that picky. If it has a uh, um, researcher from Cornell, uh, Tom Seeley, uh, as far as he can tell, it's the total cavity size that bees care about and, and how they'll figure out the wax inside in due course. Uh, he was not able to tell any difference between whether it was more of a horizontal space or a vertical space. The bees themselves don't seem to have preferences. So now top bar hive um, has some advantages in, in that for a small hobby beekeeper in that you are handling each uh, section of the hive individually. You're not handling big boxes the way I do. Um, some people think it's more natural. Uh, I'm not sure that in itself is uh, is absolutely the, the answer you're looking for. Um, I'm not convinced that that would be the right place to start as a first time beekeeper, but it's not, it's not wrong either. I guess I'm open to it. From Ian. Uh, sorry, I'm... Okay, so I think Ian is not so much asking a question as uh, echoing his support for my argument that insects need some help. Uh, thank you, Ian, for your support. And uh, I hope I gave you some ideas of how to do a little bit more. Uh, Marilyn also asks about horizontal hives. Um, and that's a top bar hive is one type of horizontal hive. <sighs> What are my thoughts? Uh, I would never do it myself, but I would never tell anyone else that they're wrong to try. Um, they do provide ways of having kind of the whole hive laid out more. I, I, at the same time, I'm, I'm not sure that they're gonna be great for wintering. Having, having I, the, be the heat moves up, so the more that hive is stacked up vertically, and that hive can naturally respirate and also naturally conserve its own heat, I think is, is an advantage that should not be discounted. I haven't used them extensively myself, so I'm, um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not gonna run it down because I, I don't know enough, but I'm, I'm politely skeptical. I hope that's a fair answer. Uh, is there a way to treat mites? Um, so, yes, there is. Uh, there's, there's a large number of choices, most of which don't work all that great. Uh, Manitoba uh, has this thing called winter that keeps us out of the hives for six and sometimes seven months of the year. And so uh, there are places in the world that have access to their hives. You know, if, in, if you're in uh, Southern Europe or Southern United States, uh, there's only a few days in a year where they would damage the hive just by taking the lid off and checking the bees. Whereas we have that for six months. And so, in places where you have more regular access to the hives, you can use treatments that might not on their own be all that effective, but that if you did it week after week after week can be, can be fairly effective. Those treatments can include things like, uh, you know, manually removing uh, frames of, of brood that look to be more severely infected uh, dosing the bees with various organic products that often have uh, the, the body chemistry of mites. They're, they're uh, like, like all mites, they have this sort of body that can expand, like a wood tick is, is uh, 
is probably the most the thing we have the most equivalent experience with, and actually is is go jumps on us the same way the mites jump on bees, and then once it gets in, you know its body kind of expands as it absorbs that nutrition out of you, and so they have these very soft pliable skins, so whereas honeybees have a, a rigid exoskeleton. That's the kind of insect they are. So a lot of organic treatments. Uh, are focused on the sensitivity of the external skin of the mite, whether with a slight acidic exposure like to vinegars or to, to salts uh, as a way of, of making that hive interior more hostile to the mites without hurting the bees. And uh, those have uh, over a prolonged period of time can be quite effective. I use in the spring a product called formic acids and I, I apply it. Uh, formic acid is the, is the acid that you get from apples as they, as they decompose. It's a, it's a natural occurring food product. Um, but in purified form, it's, it's, it's a strong acid and fairly dangerous. Uh, but if you release it at a very slow rate inside the beehives, the young mites as they emerge um, will, you know, you'll kill 75 or 80 percent of them. That's enough if you sustain that treatment to control the mites in your hive. Um, the challenge of making sure that you have those mites uh, to a low enough level in the fall that your hive can run all winter without more treatment, that's an ex uh, extremely difficult challenge. And so uh, many beekeepers will, in Manitoba, at least once a year, use some sort of synthetic treatment uh, as a way of, of knocking those mites down to nearly zero. The risk of that, and this has happened a number of times already, is that when you, when you kill 99% of a bug, the 1% that are left are the toughest, meanest ones. And uh, after a few generations of that, you've got mites that are no longer controllable. And then you need a new chemical. And we are back on that, uh, back on that chain. You know exactly the way many of us are trying to run our farms to get away from. So there's a real tension between the desire to be as much in tune with the bees and give them uh, a healthy uh, place to live, and the 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 pressure of this externally introduced pest that uh, is very difficult to control. So that was a pretty long-winded answer to a, 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 a nice, sweet, uh, short question. Yes, there is ways to treat mites. Not all of them are great and not all of them are effective. And finding the ones that work for you that you are willing to live with is the challenge every beekeeper has to work out. Have I captured all the questions? I know there was a couple people on the in the session that probably wanted to get really into you know how to beekeep, um, and you know I probably didn't satisfy that urge. I do have um, I, well, a couple of options for you. One is those that beekeeping course. If you haven't uh, participated in that, uh, there's tremendous resources in uh, things like YouTube videos. I've I've got my own YouTube channel, and so if you look up Phil the Bee Man on YouTube, uh, you'll see some videos, uh, roughly half and half of me talking about bees and, and uh, tips and tricks for beekeeping, and about half of uh, university course material um, on logic and fallacies and stuff. So um, transitioning online means we're all doing crazy things. <laughs> 